there. Welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. As we continue on now in our study of the Sermon on the Mount. This has been a blessing, and uh, I, I think you know what we've come to the conclusion is that if you're trying to find real Christianity, which is just following the life and teaching of Jesus Christ, you will find it wrapped up in the Sermon on the Mount. And we're looking at that in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Because this was where Jesus took his disciples and began training them in righteousness. Righteousness was his free gift by his atoning work, but we need to be trained to walk in that, to pursue that. So we're going to continue right on. We did last week, we uh, looked at the first of the Beatitudes, Blessed are the Poor in Spirit. So in this program, we're going to start looking at Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. But before we do that, I'm going to ask Mark to ask God's blessing on our time together in his word. Dear Lord, it says in your word in the last days, look up because your end draws near. Lord, we need to be encouraged and not mourn. Uh, although more mourning is a part of this life, Lord. But we ask you to fill our hearts with joy. Joy that cannot be broken and that will remain until we're, we are with you. Amen. Amen. So, yeah, we're going to talk about mourning. Mm -hmm. All right. Let, let's start. The logical place to start. We're going to read, blessed are those who mourn. And I've said this a lot of times. The dictionary is a place that I'm going to go. Right. To get it, you know, so we have a common ground and a common understanding of what the word means. The dictionary defines mourning as to, somebody, to feel or express sorrow or grief, to grieve or lament for the dead, to show conventional or usual signs of sorrow over a person's death, right? To feel or express sadness for the death or loss of someone or something, right? So it's always associated with death. With somebody else's death. By and large, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and we're going to look at it in, in a little bit in two parts. We're going to look at it in the Old Testament, and then we're going to look at it in the New Testament, okay? okay. Right. And in the Old Testament, i just give you a couple of, a few verses so you get a, a picture, and as I said, so we're all on the same page. Talking about Abraham and Sarah, in Genesis 23, it says, Sarah died in Kiriath Arba, that's Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Well, I can understand that. Yes. I mean, they had a great love, all right? Mm -hmm. And in the time of Moses, it says, After Moses had stripped Aaron of his garments and put them on his own son, Eleazar, Aaron died there on the mountaintop. Then Moses and Eleazar came down from the mountain. When all the congregation saw that Aaron had died, all the house of Israel wept for Aaron 30 days. Mm -hmm. Numbers 20, 28 and 29. So they're the mourning for him, they're weeping for him. And then in Deuteronomy, it talks about Moses. Although Moses was 120 years old when he died, his eye was not dim, nor his vigor abated. So the sons of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Then the days of weeping and mourning for Moses came to an end. Deuteronomy 34. Well, there's an expression of the people of God. Mourning the loss of somebody, the death of somebody, right? Mm -hmm. And it said, I mean, Jesus is saying, blessed are those who mourn. And yet, as Mark said, we're commanded to rejoice, to rejoice always. Yes. So is this not the ultimate oxymoron, a seeming contradiction? It's a paradox. We'll talk about that a little bit more. I was just thinking about David when his son was, when his son was deathly ill. ill. He went into mourning. Well, he, he was in, in deep prayer, in sorrow, okay. for the state of his son. But then when his son died, he stopped. Right. All right. Okay. Um, well, we, can, we can talk about that because maybe David is having kind of a, a, a New Testament attitude. All right. Okay. You know, it says in, in the Psalms that weeping may endure for the night, but joy cometh in the morning. So there's a time of sorrow. I mean, isn't that clear in Ecclesiastes? Yes. 
In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, it says, there's an appointed time for everything. Mm -hmm. And there's a time for every event under heaven. There's a time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. That's Ecclesiastes 3. That's verse 1 and verse 4. Now, we're to, we're to mourn now in the New Testament, but we mourn not for the redeemed, because the redeemed are going to live forever. Right. It's okay. Those who are perishing. But for those who are the walking dead, mm. and that's what it says twice in Ephesians two one, for example, the, the the walking dead are those who have not received eternal life. And they're at risk of dying forever. Yes. Starting with you, by the way, if you've yet to receive the free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. So this becomes a bit about salvation. Okay? Yes. Because salvation is about life and death. Right. 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 I, I just have to share this real quick. Um, my mother died prior to my being saved. And the simple fact of the matter is, I don't know what her spiritual state was, because I wasn't in any position to assess that. I didn't, I didn't know anything spiritual at the time. Mm -hmm. However, my father passed him uh, after Al Alice and I had both been saved, and he came up and spent some time with us, and about a, maybe a little less than a year after we had been saved, my father accepted the Lord, mm -hmm. and that night he passed away. And it was unexpected. Right. I think both of those things were unexpected. It was unexpected that when I, when I was speaking with him and he said that he wanted what I had, he wanted that relationship with Jesus Christ. That was, if unexpected, it was certainly hoped for. Yes. And then the next day I got a call from my aunt saying my father had passed away that night. Well, I, I get that news in the middle of a prayer meeting of a couple of hundred people. I was called to the telephone, I went off, and I came back, and I, I said to everybody, I've just been informed my father passed away in the middle of the night. And the immediate reaction was, oh, oh, you know, this, this yeah. kind of sorrow, which is understandable. Mm -hmm. However, I said, stop. I said, stop. See, this is, you know, I've been saved for 40 years. My father got saved, and pow, zoom, straight into the, yeah. who did he know? He had better connections than me. It doesn't it say somewhere, do the works of salvation? So for him, all he had to do is get saved and boom, well, gone. No, no. <clears throat> no it says work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But it, you don't gain salvation by, by works. Right. It's, it's a free gift of God. So he had gotten that free gift. Well, right? he didn't have to do anything after. God didn't have anything for him to do other than to accept him. And then, right. boom, gone. He, you have, don't have anything else to do except to accept him to get your salvation either. Yeah. Well, okay. God has something for me to do. That's why I'm still it's here. Purpose. But it's yes, purpose. but his, pur his purpose for you being here now, and this is important mm -hmm. for others. Well, no, it's not for your salvation, but for somebody else's. That's right. Precisely. Because, because our purpose in being here is to mourn over the lost and present them with the gospel of Jesus Christ, which opens the door to eternal life. All right? Because the first. Per, per, you know, the first death that a person should mourn over is their own. Exactly. All right? Yeah. I mean, that's recognizing. You, you get saved. Now, you may not have understood it this way when you got saved, but it's the fact that you recognize that you're dead because you're separated from God. Mm. And separation from God is death. Yes. It's not your body stops breathing. You know, it's, it, this should be obvious to us when we look at Adam and the woman in the garden. And God said, it from the, the day that you eat from that tree that he commanded them not to eat, that day you die. Now, he watches over his word to perform, perform it, and his word can't be broken. So the day that they sinned, they were cast out of... Now, I'm sure you're expecting me to say they were cast out of the garden, which indeed they were. But important, more importantly was they were cast out away from the presence of God. And that is spiritual death. It says in Isaiah 59 that, you know, our sin separates us from God. Well, that's spiritual death. Mm -hmm. But if you're saved, a child of God spared by the gift of Jesus Christ and Him crucified, then the, that event of your death and resurrection began with a recognition of the fact that you were dead. 
even if you didn't understand it in those terms. You just understood that you're a sinner, okay? And that sin put you away from, from a right relationship with God. It's always been a matter of life and death. That's why Jesus proclaimed, I came to bring life. That's when he's contrasting his purpose to the enemy's purpose, who comes to steal, to destroy, right? Jesus said, I came to bring life. So, it says in Acts 3.26. I have a question. Okay. Do you think that people, when, when you get saved, uh, the mourning that we do is, um, we mourn the fact that we had sinned and we it took us so long, we, you know, we think it took us so long to recognize him and we're mourning the, the time that we didn't. I, I, I can't answer that question because I think that may vary a little bit with each one. Each but let me just go back to what I said in the very, very beginning of this, right? Mm -hmm. To mourn is to feel or express sorrow or grieve. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. To show signs of sorrow. Right. And be well, sorrowful. Another, another word for that is, in your life, repentance. Yes. yes. Because repentance is about being sorry for what you've done. That is. So you're it's mourning. Like mourning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But, and that's sorrow. However, see, it says in the New Testament, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul says, For the sorrow that's according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret. Right. So it's not about regret, it leads to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. Yes. So, you know, we have a, we have a repentance that leads to joy. Right. Because it leads to life. Mm -hmm. You know, the good news is always preceded by the bad news. This is what brings you to that place of repentance. Because it, it says, I mentioned this, you know, Paul says in Ephesians, in the second chapter of Ephesians, and he says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. So we were, we were dead walking in our transgressions, in our sins. Mm -hmm. You know, everything, Satan has no creative power. He can only, he can only pervert truth. He can't, to create something is to bring something into existence. Mm -hmm. A lie is not something that's been brought into existence. It's something that has twisted what was in existence, and the truth pre-existed every lie. Right. All right? So all this stuff, it's incredible how much of the entertainment world today is fixated on zombies and yes. walking dead and yes. vampires. That's because that is the spiritual imitation of the truth. Mm. Trust me, there are walking dead. Yes. And everybody out there that is trotting the streets of this world today without a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. They are the, they are the walking dead. Mm -hmm. And you and I should be mourning for them. Yes. Yes. Have you no love? I mean, that's what it is. God, being rich in mercy because of His great love, with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, 4, and 6. So there's a process of recognition, repentance, and resurrection. You recognize the fact that you're separated from God, that you're dead. You repent, you have sorrow over that. All right? And you change your mind, and God raises you up. That's a resurrection in your life. You are raised into new life. Because it says, you know, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Still in Ephesians chapter 1. This is one of the things I said, you know, we are looking for true Christianity. What, what is it really supposed to look like? I, I said, let me read John 16, 20, okay? Because I talked about we have a repentance that leads to joy. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, that you will weep and lament, 
but the world will rejoice. That's that they're out there having their carousing and fooling. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. John 16, 20. And then Paul writes, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? 1 Corinthians 15, 55. Jesus conquered death for anybody, whosoever will, believe in him. Just as he said, and just as it's written. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. I think you know that's probably John 3.16. We can't tell. It's like, you know, it's, it's just strange. It seems we can't tell the dead from the living sometimes. You know, Mark Twain, the, old, the American humorist and writer, wrote, after his obituary had been posted in a major newspaper, he said, reports of my death. Have been greatly exaggerated. <laughs> okay, death is like pregnancy. You either are or you aren't. Yeah, right. It's, it's very digital. But the problem is, people can't recognize it. So when my father passed on, he didn't die. He is. If you do, you believe the word of God, or do you not believe the word of God? Jesus said, "He who believes in me, even if he dies, yet shall he live." Right. We have eternal life. That's the death has been conquered. Christians are not supposed to mourn over Christians. Now, i got to tell you, I understand we do that because of the sense of loss, the pain that we incur. Yeah. It, you know, it, it's, it should be a joyous occasion for the person who's going on to be with the Lord. And just knowing that you're going to see them again. Which is like, like David. Yeah. David said, he's talking about his son, he can't come to me, but I, I'm going to go to him. Yeah. Oh, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Do we truly have that sense, that belief, that the life that we have in Christ Jesus is eternal? You know, it says that it's appointed unto man to die once and end the judgment. Every man is, you have to die once. At least once. Yes. You die once, right? Die twice, you live once forever. I died, it wasn't so terrible. Now, people say, you know, I had an encounter with a, a truck. I had a <clears throat> fist fight with a speeding truck on a road in Belize. People say, oh boy, I must be almost died. I didn't almost die. I died the day that I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I died to myself. And he raised me from the dead. And now I shall live forever. Will this body, this, this perishable body, will it cease to function? Praise God. Yes. I'm looking forward to a new one. It's like, you know, if you knew you had some 30-year-old clunker of a, of a car, and you knew that you were about to pick up a new one this coming Saturday, uh, would you be lamenting that? Or would you be rejoicing in it? Well, i got to tell you something. I'm, I'm getting pretty much ready for that new imperishable body. I've, I've used this one up really good. Hallelujah. It says in Hebrew 9.27, Inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, after this comes judgment. So if you die as in being born again, the judgment as is pronounced. But if you die with your sin, the judgment is also pronounced. That's why there's a second death. And that second death for Christians is just a transfer into the oh, kingdom no, no. of God. We don't have a second death. We only do. Oh, we only it's have the one. To, yeah. It's appointed unto man to die once. Okay. So you can, this is, this is God's, that's what God appointed. Oh, die once as right? in the physical death. Which is why Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, you must be born again. again. And when you are born again, then you can say as Paul did, for I have died and my life is hidden with, Christ, with God in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus. So the dying once is for a Christian to die a physical death. It's to die twice is for a non-Christian to die a physical physical death, and then a spiritual and then death a spiritual after death. that. Right. The second. Okay. The Bible calls it the second death. Okay. So, so yes, I mean, it, you should have this absolute sense that you have a guaranteed life. This is why Jesus could say, "Don't fear those who can kill the body; they can't kill your spirit." Right. Your spirit David said, "Leave this." Th What's... David said that this life is but a breath; it's but a vapor. You know, we, we're clinging too much. It's not that we're clinging to life. 
because life was a free gift of God, we're clinging to the world. And this is where the difficulty arises, is when you're clinging to the world. We're supposed to be in the world, but not of it. It shouldn't be a problem to separate from it when you truly believe that where you're going is better. There's, there's a song, you know, I, I, I'll, I will, I'll distract myself here. Uh, there was a, a dear lady in our congregation when I was the pastor of a church back in, in Central Florida here. Gosh, that's going back over 30 years. And after we had come back from uh, Central America and we were living back in Southern Florida, I got a call and she had pancreatic cancer. And her, her life expectancy at that point was very short. We came up and I spent time with her in the hospital and she had no particular desire to pray for healing. And she, because she had a rough time, and she was more than ready to go to that great by and by. And what awaited her, that what awaited her was the Lord with open arms. Mm -hmm. But one of her favorite songs was a song that she had heard Alice and I sing a number of times, which was, I'm Just a Poor Wayfaring Stranger, which is a song, it's an old, old uh, hymn mm -hmm. about you know how we're just here, we're just Poor wayfaring stranger, we're just passing through, and that's a very scriptural appraisal. Mm -hmm. Going to some place, but I'm going to go across that Jordan. I'm going to go. I'm going to see my father again. By the way, I'm going to see the ones that I've loved. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to see that those who have gone on before me. But most importantly, I'm going to see the Lord. You know, it's like the, what lies ahead of us. And Jesus said, "Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me." He said, "I go to prepare a place. The place that's wonderful." But that's not what I'm looking forward to. Seeing my Father and, and the other saints of God, that's, that's wonderful. But what I'm looking forward to is coming face to face mm -hmm. with Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That's my goal. At the end of the day, that is my goal. And that is the promise of what awaits me and you. So why fear going? Why fear what the world can do to you here? If we mourn, I mean... The sorrow, if you mourn a Christian who you've, you've loved dearly and, and that person goes to be with the Lord, I can understand. I, I mean, we've had people that we've loved dearly who have gone on to be with the Lord, all right? But the, the hurt and the pain is ours, not theirs. And that hurt and the pain is the flesh, all right? Because it's just a, it's a, just a temporary separation. What we have to begin to understand is our purpose here is to mourn, to feel sorrow, to deep sorrow, deep, deep sorrow for those who are truly dead now. Listen, let me read you this from Luke 19. When he, Jesus, approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known it this day, even you, the things which made for peace, but now they've been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade and surround you and hem you on every side and will level you on the ground and your children with you. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. They didn't recognize the Messiah who had come to bring them eternal life. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. I have to tell you something. Jesus was not a fan of mourning for... He, show, me some, show me a Christian that Jesus mourned for when he passed. He heard, you know, he heard about Lazarus. He kind of mourned before him because he was pulling him back into this world. Well, not, I, I, not, that's... Uh, We'd have to have a deep, deep theological discussion about that. And it says, you know, the shortest verse in the Bible is in John chapter 11. It says, Jesus wept. And he wept over him at that time. You don't know what he wept for. Doesn't he doesn't that? know what he wept for. No, 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 you don't know what he yes. wept for. Yes, we don't know what he wept for. Right. It says, Jesus wept. The fact is, he had said, because they didn't understand, they were saying, Lazarus died. And he said, no, he's just asleep. Right. They didn't understand. Mm -hmm. So he's not, there's no sense of loss there. Right? But when Jesus hears that Lazarus is quote unquote dead, he doesn't mourn. 
he goes and attacks death. Yes. And that is certainly not the only instance. And we're going to talk about more instances like that. Once somebody is gone, I mean, you know, it says, it's appointed unto man to die once, then the judgment. Once you're gone from this planet, it's over. That's right. In spite of what any other religions, including so-called Christian religions, may say. You know, in Luke 16 it says, Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And besides all this, between us and you, he said, there is a great chasm fixed so that those who wish to come over from there to you will not be able and that none may be able to cross over from there to us. You can't go. You know, once you, you're born, you're gone. That's it. That's, that's it. The opportunity is here and now. Both life and death in the spirit are irreversible and eternal. We saw what happened with Abraham, with Moses, but that was before the coming of the Word who was made flesh and dwelt among us. I Let me see if I can get into this. You know, in the New Testament, now this is after, we know the Word. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up, and on seeing Jesus, fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. That's Mark 5, 22 and 23. So on the way to Jairus' house, all right, he has an encounter with the woman who has been hemorrhaging for 12 years. It says, They came from the house of the synagogue official and said, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? Jesus kept on going. And he saw a commotion and the people loudly weeping and wailing when he got to the house. They were mourning mm -hmm. that young girl. But Jesus says, taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which translated means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl rose and began to walk. She was 12 years old and immediately they were completely astounded. Matt, this is in Mark 5, 41 42. You know, Jesus didn't mourn. Everybody else is mourning over this girl. He attacked death. Yes. Because Jesus Christ came into this world, was made flesh to conquer death. Oh, spiritual and eternal death. That's why he came. So you wouldn't die. The mourning of the world, even religious people, is sympathy and powerless. The comfort of Jesus Christ is the power of life. Death has been conquered. Well, praise God. We're going to talk more about this in our in our next session because I I, I got to tell you there is a lot of meat in the word yes, here in this. But I want to promise you that the life that God has given you, if you've accepted Him, is forever and ever, and has conquered death. Father, we thank you for that. In the precious name of Your Son Jesus Christ. Help us to walk in the fullness of that new light. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, till the next time we gather here at the old computer or television or wherever you're seeing us on, may God bless you and goodbye. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross and the emblem of suffering and shame But I love that old cross Where the dearest and best For a world of lost sinners